Address tube failure causes. Tube failures, what, so what a tube failure means in the first place is that we've got a, whether it be in our evaporator or if we have a water-cooled condenser, either way, so being a chiller, you're going to have a hydronic evaporator. That is kind of the baseline definition of what makes a chiller to begin with. So if it's a chiller, it's a hydronic evaporator. So you've got a set of tubes in there on some level. Um, and then you could have a hydronic heat ex or a condenser, water-cooled condenser, be another way of saying that. There is a, a few ways to go about this or as to why the tube has failed. You could have general erosion. If you've got a system that has got a lot of debris in it and it's flowing a lot of heavy debris, <clears throat> whether that be mud, silt, whatever the case, other parts from the system, that can put a lot of extra wear on the tubing itself. And it's also gonna mean you're having to brush those tubes far more often, which brushing the tubes as they act creates more wear. As more wear is added, you thin the wall of the tube. And eventually the tube wall can get so thin that it can't hold up to the refrigerant pressure and the water pressure anymore, and a leak is allowed to happen, or it ends up forming. So general erosion is one of the methods and more than just like say contaminants in the water system, also high GPM. So if you're flowing excessive GPM through your heat exchanger, then that extra water flow is going to add additional erosion because it's flowing through there far faster and harder than it technically needs to. And that puts more wear on your tube wall. Erosion of it is one way. Uh, just straight um, debris causing a puncture is another. There's a property that we've worked at that the pump strainers, some of them had collapsed and just disintegrated into a bunch of different pieces and made its way through the piping network. And most of the time, our pumps are going to be pushing directly into our chiller. What happened in this case is those little fragments got into the condenser specifically, and they were big enough and sharp enough that as they went through the condenser, it just started punching holes on the way on its way through. And that led to that that technically it was two different chillers, but it led to having to plug a bunch of those tubes until eventually it just got to the point where you, we, we had exceeded the amount we could plug and still have any reasonable amount of function um, in addition to just trying to stop the leaks in general. So having a debris that actually is able to puncture a tube is another way to have a tube failure. One of the saddest ways of having a tube failure is to have the tube freeze. Now, there's two cases where this could happen. One, you could have a genuine freeze at your facility. We actually had this happen in Texas, and it devastated us because we don't have the same um, winter protection, like winterization that you have in other places, such as we don't run glycol in our loops. None of our loops are designed for glycol. We typically don't drain our loops, or at least we used to not, uh, because the down period was so short and we had enough insulation that we rarely got cold enough long enough. And usually flowing water was more than adequate to protect our tubes in the winter time. When it got below freezing, we just, we kicked the pumps on flow water for a little for, for that period of time. And we never had an issue. So what we had happen was the freeze happened. A lot of properties, their generators were not properly maintained. They failed couldn't keep the pumps flowing, couldn't keep what heat trace we had flowing, and we had heat exchangers uh, freeze up and bust everywhere. I mean, everywhere. It was a, it, it really wrecked us. So the tubes freezing, so basically the ones that are most susceptible to this would be a flooded or, or a falling film design where the water is inside the tubes. And essentially when water freezes, it expands. You know, ice, uh, it, it expands out. So if you've got your tube and we have a little bit of water that gets frozen in there and that water freezes, it expands and it just straight out ruptures that tube and busts it. So that is one way. Now, aside from just an, a, a freeze condition, 
if you're not careful or don't follow proper practices with recovery and charging, you will also create that same freezing condition because essentially any tubes that are submerged below the liquid refrigerant and that liquid refrigerant is allowed to get below freezing temperatures in saturation, which typically it's, it's a common thing to have happen when you're rec recovering. Now, now there's ways of not, again, if you're not following proper, proper practices, you will very likely have liquid, liquid refrigerant making contact with tubes that still have water in them. And if you are not flowing water through those tubes, or if you have not drained that barrel, either way, that water that's sitting still will freeze and will rupture. And you've got a really bad day on your hands at that point. So uh, call it malpractice, if you will, or just ignorance with recovering and charging procedures. You can freeze water in a tube and cause it to fail or rupture or bust. Another one would be saddle wear. So these tubes that are going through the heat exchangers, they're sitting in a set of, of racks, if you will, let's call it that. And these racks, they can end up becoming a rubbing point. Depending on refrigerant conditions, depending on um, flow conditions, uh, water flow. And I'll give a, a really clear example of this, the subcooler rack for a YK. It is very important that we maintain proper liquid level in the condenser for a YK because if the refrigerant level drops too low, it creates a lot of cur uh, currents or specifically eddy currents inside of the subcooler housing. Those eddy currents will allow extra turbulence to rub on the tubes. And that extra rubbing will eventually lead to a hole being rubbed in a tube because of the rack. And then that leads, obviously, to the hole in tube, you had a failure, right? And then your water and refrigerant start to mix. That's an example of, of what, of a situation that can happen that where the, if not managed correctly, the tube can rub and get a hole rubbed in it from the rack assembly itself. Now, another one is the actual in plate itself. Expansion and contraction from the water cycle of heating up and the chiller shutting off, shutting down, different temp uh, seasonal shifts. So anytime that metal is getting hot and cold, so you've got a steel in plates uh, for the tube sheets, and then you've got uh, copper tubes most of the time and what we're working on. Well, those metals expand and contract at different levels or at different rates. Uh, so in, it, enough of that over time or just general vibration and, and where high excessive flow can cause additional vibration that can contribute to those uh, tube sheets uh, where, the, where the tubes themselves are swedged into the, the end plate, those can become leak points as well more than just the internals of the tube between the two end plates, the actual end plates themselves uh, where the tube is swedged to the end plate can also become the leak point. So these are a, a variety of set of ways that a tube can fail or tubes depending on the circumstances. And depending on the type of failure depends on what we can do. Mo the most common thing to do, ideally you catch it early enough where it's not a catastrophic failure, ideally. In that event, you're going to plug that tube with a set of plugs. Now to do that, you're opening up both sides of the, uh, of the tube sheet. Okay, so uh, that'll just kind of depend on your piping on how difficult that will be, whether it's a two pass, or a single pass or otherwise, but you're going to open up the uh, both ends of the tube sheet and then that particular tube that is leaking or let's say you had an eddy current test done and you found that one, you, ha you had a couple of tubes in there with a really thin wall so they were dangerously thin, put a little bit of, of sealer on a plug. So the uh, 515 uh, by uh, Loctite would be a, a popular choice for this. Put a little 515 on it and you're going to hammer that plug into that tube and ideally stop it. Now, before you put the plug in, it is recommended to use some nitrogen or something and try to blow that water out of there and dehydrate that tube ahead of time so that if a failure did end up happening, uh, whatever moisture is in there 
isn't able to get into the machine and vice versa. Pluggy tube sheets, that's one of the most common ways about it. Now, if you had a catastrophic failure, which I've seen some of these where it literally floods the chiller. So first of all, the refrigerant, now if it's a high pressure machine, the refrigerant's gonna flow out into the water circuit, but a low pressure machine, water's just coming straight in. And so in a catastrophic event, that I, I've I've literally seen uh, I've, I've I've had pictures sent to me of CVHs that the water level was up into the suction nose cone, uh, just at how much had filled up in the chiller and then sat there on top of that. So that would be catastrophic. Like that'd be the definition of catastrophic. In that event, you've got to do a complete overhaul of that entire machine. So if it was that bad more than likely it's going to be worth it to have the machine retube at that point. And there are companies out there that specialize in this. I personally have not done a retubing myself. Unless you have a team internally to your organization that does that, there are some really good companies out there who do that very, very well. In the process of trying to rebuild this machine and put it back together, it's going to be recommended to do a retube and if you're going to do a retube, you're going to redo all the tubes. Like that is, that is my recommendation. Like you're not just going to do the ones you think that are bad because the cost of going to that extent to begin with, to bring that machine back to life is not worth the risk of leaving old tubes in place to begin with. You, you end up going through and just doing all the tubes new so that everything is fresh. And that's a very extensive process either plugging the tube or depending on the extent of the failure potentially retubing the machine are going to be the primary ways of uh, getting that leak to stop or or not having it uh, affect the rest of the machine and if you had a a, a tube sheet leak where it was leaking at where it's it's swedged into the end plate a lot of the time I've found that doing the plug and putting the plug in in the first place is actually enough that it will inevitably seal. Not always, um, but I found that that is a common way to get one to reseal without having to literally reswedge it. Is just putting a plug in in the first place forces that swedge to expand out and reseat into the uh, tube sheet itself. If you're not already in Chiller Academy, I'd really encourage you to go check it out. Just think about it, right? Uh, this is what I do full time. I, I've, I've committed, I've stepped out of the field, committed my career to this going forward. This is what I've always wanted to do and to be able to educate, help others and grow and help this industry take step, steps forward. Um, so chilleracademy.com, like I'd, I'd love to be able to work with you over there. We've got a community page. Uh, every, all the lessons have a comment section. That's where I spend a lot of my day doing. If I'm not working on the lesson material itself, then I am in the comments and I'm trying to respond to those as fast as I can, uh, in addition to helping you through email and otherwise. So love to be able to work with you. For all of those that are in the academy, y'all are doing some great work out there. Keep it up. I really appreciate the support and the feedback that you've given. 